Okay, let's uh, get our next guest in. Uh, Peter Schiff, who's CEO of Euro Pacific Capital. He joins us from Dorado in Puerto Rico. And Peter Schiff, of course, uh, sort of predicted the financial crisis as far back as 2006. So, Peter, great to have you on the show. I'd love to get your comments here about Seth Klarman there. Uh, Dan just read the quote here. Uh, it's saying that if things go wrong, we could find ourselves at the beginning beginning of a lengthy decline in dollar hegemony and a rapid rise in interest rates and inflation and global angst. I mean, do you agree? Well, it's going to happen regardless whether things go right or wrong. I think it's inevitable at this point. So it's not a question of uh, will that happen. It's just a question of when. It's a question of when. Okay, let's talk about the trade deficit very quickly because these are numbers that you know, don't, don't get a whole lot of attention usually, but, but this year because of the focus on the trade deficit from the Trump administration, a lot of people paying attention to it. The trade balance negative for the 41st year in a row. How effective do you think that Donald Trump's policies will be in narrowing that gap? Well, so far, we're not really sure what the policy is going to be. I don't think that tariffs are necessarily going to do it. Uh, I think what the, the problem is that America, you know, we don't save enough, and so we don't have the capital available to make the investments that are necessary to finance production. Our taxes are too high. Our regul regulations are too many. Uh, so we need substantial deregulation. We need lower taxes. But in order to finance that, we need a smaller government. So major reforms have to take place. You know, meanwhile, the trade deficit that we had last year was the largest, I think, in four years. It's over $500 billion. And there are a lot of people out there that don't think a trade deficit is a bad thing because they think the trade deficit is enabling a capital account surplus but a capital account surplus is not a good thing it means you're selling off your assets you're going into debt and your trading partners are accumulating assets Sets in exchange for the products they sell you. So you don't want to go into debt. You don't want to be obligated to pay interest and dividends to your trading partners. You want to run a surplus and you want to get richer. You want to accumulate assets. But we are not doing that. And I don't think that we're going to achieve uh, a meaningful reduction in our trade deficits simply by negotiating better deals. We have to get to the real heart of why America is so uncompetitive. And it's yet to be seen whether the Trump administration is actually going to be able to achieve that. Mm. Uh, Peter, I wanted to get your thinking on the trading dynamics right now. We saw the Nasdaq hitting a record uh, overnight. Do you think that investors are placing too much of a bet on Trump's policies and this expansionary fiscal agenda? Yes, I, I do. And I think they're overlooking the contractionary uh, impact of rising interest rates, not necessarily just the, re the rates that the Fed controls, but look at what's happened to the long end of the bond market since Trump was elected. And even though, you know, we did get that big reaction in the market at the end of last year, so far this year in 2017, the Dow is not making much in the way of gains. It's up maybe another 1%, but no, what no one is talking about, gold is up 7% so far in 2017. You know, there's a, the GDXJ is an index of junior gold mining stocks. It's up 33% this year just since January 1st. Uh, and meanwhile, the dollar is starting to go down. It hasn't gone down that much yet against uh, the euro, but you know, look at the Australian dollar. I think it's up 6% or so this year against the US dollar. But I think the dollar is starting to roll over. Gold is breaking out. Gold stocks have really started to move. So I think most investors are missing what's really going on uh, because they're fixated on the Dow. The emerging markets are starting to, starting to uh, improve. And I think those trends will continue throughout the year. And anyone who knows uh, Schiff's stick, so to speak, anyone who's followed you really closely knows you're an absolute gold bull uh, in the core of your heart. Um, tell me, how do you think the Fed responds, though, to this expansionary fiscal agenda, especially at the peak of the cycle as well, Peter? We're getting a stimulus at a time when we don't really need it. Well, we never needed stimulus because this stimulus is actually a sedative. Everything the Federal Reserve did to stimulate the economy undermined the economy. That's the reason that Donald Trump is president, because all this stimulus made the economy so sick. I mean, what we need to stimulate is not stock prices or real estate prices or bond prices, but real economic growth. And that comes from underproduct consumption, from savings, from capital investment, and that comes from higher interest rates. That's what we needed all along was higher interest rates but we got a monetary heroin instead and so the economy never got healthy it's sicker than ever and that is the problem
problem. And I do believe that the Federal Reserve is going to ignore rising inflation as it manifests in consumer prices. I don't believe that that will be the case on the other side of the Atlantic. I think there will be enough pressure uh, from the Bundesbank on the ECB that they're going to have to take away some of their stimulus just as the Fed is adding. So I think you're going to see tighter monetary policy in Europe and you're going to get looser monetary policy in the U.S. because the Fed is going to try to artificially prop up this economy as it weakens uh, with uh, eventually dialing back the rate hike talk eventually cutting rates and going back to QE4. None of this is going to work, but it is going to accelerate the decline of the dollar and you know, bring about uh, the, the problems that uh, the hedge fund manager alluded to uh, with respect to what would happen if things go wrong, because there's no other way that they could go but wrong. Um, and and also, I just wanted to ask you about the, uh, the topic du jour. Akiko and I were talking about this earlier, which is um, Dodd-Frank. Are you concerned about the uh, ambiguity surrounding the plans to scale back Dodd-Frank and what does it uh, present when it comes to risk in your view? Well, Dodd-Frank was a bad idea. I mean, look, at it. it was named after Chris Dodd and Barney Frank two of the most influential members of Congress that helped to create the financial crisis because they protected Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and they resisted all efforts to rein them in. The financial crisis was not caused by a lack of regulation, but by the central bank, by Alan Greenspan keeping rates too low, and by the moral hazards of, uh, of Fannie and Freddie and government guaranteed bank accounts. So Dodd-Frank did nothing uh, to mitigate uh, the prospects for a future financial crisis. If anything, it, it, it accelerated them because what we needed to do in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis was to take power away from the Fed and the government. Instead, they got more. But what scares me is to the extent that we do manage to roll back some of the regulation that never should have been enacted. And when the inevitable financial crisis hits to the extent that it happens after this deregulation, I can already hear the left now blaming the crisis on that deregulation. That crisis is inevitable. It's going to happen whether we get rid of a Dodd-Frank or not. But it was bad legislation and we should get rid of it. But when we do, it is not going to be the reason that we have another financial crisis. The reason is, is going to be the Fed. The same, the same uh, reason that we had the first one is why the second one is going to be even worse. And Peter, you said that investors are sort of missing the bigger picture here. They're so fixated on the Dow and that level there. Uh, you mentioned emerging markets as a potential space here. Where are you seeing the opportunities outside of the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, they're happening in many countries, just like if you remember, when uh, Bill Clinton was president and when his presidency ended and, and George Bush came in, there was a lot of optimism that the rally in the U.S. stock market would continue, that the strength of the dollar would continue, and instead everything reversed. And if you remember, the emerging markets had a lot of difficulties in the late 1990s with the Asian economic uh, meltdown in 97, and there are a lot of things happening outside the United States. So emerging markets really got beat up uh, also in, in, in South America or Latin America. But that all changed in 2001. As the U.S. stock market went down, money started to flow back into those areas. And people made a lot of money uh, in emerging markets, in commodities, in precious metals, you know, in oil, in agriculture. And I think the same dynamics are lining up again. Only I think that President Trump has inherited a much bigger bubble uh, from Obama than the one that Bush inherited from Clinton. And so I think the dollar's going a lot lower this time, and I think commodity prices could go a lot higher. So there's a much more, a bigger profit potential now uh, than there was back then in, in the right markets. Okay, Peter, we're going to have to leave it on that note. It's always good to get your insights. Peter Schiff joining us from Euro Pacific Capital.